Okay, so welcome back. Today is a different camera setup. Please forgive me. Well, the camera should matter as much as the shared screen does. Um, so today we have a uh, few things that I want to bring to the table or discuss a bit. Uh, starting, of course, first with the as or uh, perhaps a feedback on the reviewing situation. Are there any massive hiccups? I know at least one hiccup, but perhaps there are other ones that hadn't been observations people have. So uh, uh, apparently one student has a problem that there was a session timeout. So uh, if you um, spend too much time on the review form itself appears, it times out and you lose the information, which is not desirable. And something that I yeah, made an issue of, of course, for our review of this thing. Um, as I said, we have limited capacity to review the program while it's running. So we don't want to risk any you know, interference by redeploying it right now. But um, so that's something we need to take away from this and kind of see if we can Either I introduce automated saving, which I think is kind of contemporary, to be able to do that, uh, but at least ensure that session timeout is long enough, uh, you know, for people to review uh, more extensively. So that's a good takeaway there. But are there any other observations that you guys have? Well, that's by intent not, right? I think, I think that's uh, for the last. Um, two points. Uh, I know, and that, I mean, we have discussed it at length and breadth, you may imagine. Um, so we model this peer review process largely alongside a uh, one-sided blind review process as you do in science. And that's generally the conventional approach there um, to, to, to do it this way. But I have a better idea um, that is um, something we don't have in the system yet is a notification system. So you can, for example, flag a review for as inappropriate or whatever else, as you know from YouTube and other kinds, or ask for explanations or clarifications and so on, right? So we could foster why the system anonymous interaction between, you know, me as the reviewer who is, you know, and, and you as the reviewee saying, hey, I don't understand, I don't, I disagree with this, uh, you know, mark that you made here. Can you please review that item with respect? That was a possible version because people oversee stuff. I oversee stuff all the time. Like it's like impossible if you look at. You know, too many assignments to get it consistently done so that's not surprising but if you especially fear the you know hostility concern which is a valid concern especially in large in large environments um usually we hadn't had that here but you never know i agree um so then you should be able to flag and say a uh, lecture should get notified and lecture can deal with this um so that's the angle we want to take it i guess because there's the other risk if you do it um having too much identifiability on both sides and you have on one side already anyway right, i mean yeah. But only one way, and that's that's also okay in a scientific sense. So that's that's not not conjecture because um, uh, uh, the idea is there that you guys don't become too cozy with each other in terms of the reviews because that could also have a negative impact, right? So in a sense that you have give desirable feedback, right? Once you personalize or you know uh, relate to a person, then it makes it a lot easier to to have, 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 have um, those kind of challenges. There. So we want to retain a level of objectivity in as far. As possible. I mean, the right way would be to you send the URLs, we pull the stuff, anonymize everything, provide you with the corresponding with. But you know, that's those aspirations we definitely have in our mind, but we haven't realized them yet. But I agree with your concern. I mean, there's very pragmatic points to it, like, oh, someone forgot to make the repo pri uh, public, or whatever, right? So it's like, you know, tick that thing, and then the person gets notification, fix that thing, uh, and or I disagree with your review, or here's my challenge. Because rebuttal phases are commonplace as well in science. When you get a review, you have an opportunity always to respond um, as well. And that needs to be recognized by the supervisor in a way that's like usually a, a, a chair, a review chair, like that would be me or any of those guys here basically to see you know, whether that makes sense. Um, so, but if you feel uh, for now, <laughs> absent that feature, if you feel that your review is either not, 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 not fair or uh, you know, you feel attacked, or there's you, you observe such um, concerns that you raise. This got to me easy, right? Or mail to me, whatever. Of course. I mean, if any, I had some incident students said, Yeah, I just I don't, I don't agree with your view because of, you know, there are some items, then 
uh, I happily intervened and uh, offered moderation. That's not a big deal. Just get into there. Can you have a look at this again or whatever else? Or I do it myself. We, are, by the way, have override ability. So if we disagree with one of your know, reviews activities, we can also change them uh, possibly. That said, we don't do that unmotivated, uh, but rather upon request. But sometimes an easy shortcut to say, hey, can you just switch this and then we'll find our way there. Um, now that I'm doing unmotivated. It is something else anyway in this crop right now. But, uh, but uh, yeah, so your concerns are valid. Peer review is tricky. How do you write too much anonymity? Not good, too little, also not good, especially in a small setting. With 500 students, yeah, I wouldn't care about real name anymore because chances that you cross, your past cross are like, uh, you know, tiny, right? So if it was in Tron time where they have really large courses, then it would be quite different. But here it's, you know, borderline 70 odd students. Yeah, and databases is harder, I guess, but here it's still feasible that you guys know each other. I mean, you probably know each other anyway, to some extent. Comment. Oh, I'm too loud. Ah, that's my laptop. Ah, this aging machine. Yeah, it makes the background noise. Let me suggest the following. Um, I just grabbed my the external camera, which I had forgotten today, uh, for my room. In fact, I'll be back in like uh, you know a few minutes, and I'll, I'll um, change the perspective. Uh, in the meantime, you can still uh, reflect if there are some issues with the peer review. So, is that a word? Cool. Let's continue here. All right. Sorry for the disruption. Um, a pledge betterment, and remember my camera now I know why I need this anyway um come back to this any more comments on the review room process should be straightforward right clicking links and stuff so that's not the challenge you made the challenge bit is actually to learn about other people's codes what's your experience so far good bad or ugly well nah. or I haven't done it yet it's okay should be right yeah? okay like general experience yeah 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 I found it very, uh, very good. I feel like I've learned a lot from okay. reviewing all the code. But there's some things that I, I haven't thought of myself that uh, I, I will start implementing, I will start using. Right. So, That's good. Good. Yeah. That was the expectation that you guys see two or three different ways of doing one thing. I mean, not for all this. Most of the things are like stock standard, right? But there are some uh, different ways that people certainly have found. I've seen quite amazing code, to be honest. Uh, I kind of glimpse, I always cheat a bit and glimpse a bit into the uh, different submissions and see, and that, you see everything. There's an ex extreme breadth. Sometimes you can't really learn much from the code, right? But sometimes you can learn a lot. So it, you know, just, just depends a bit. So I just want to mention that also as encouragement to possibly engage in more reviews than you need. Of course, you get reward for this, but that's not the point. The point is you get this free opportunity to not worry about the domain because you know the domain. Guess what? You did the same assignment, right? Uh, but you see the different ways. It's a nice way of isolating it. And that's oftentimes challenging in other forms of peer review. For example, if you look, review uh, different projects by different people that have all different topics, then you waste more time understanding what they actually want as opposed to how they realized it, right? And here you have this nice way that you all work on the kind of the same thing. Uh, that's good. I'm happy you have this experience. That's uh, hopefully helpful in, in learning more about Go. And everyone uses slightly different resources and so on. So it's uh, okay. Um, the other aspect is assignment two. So my homework for you was, however moderate that is, uh, to kind of look at it, understand it, and tell me what you don't know yet. Not you guys, you know everything about this, but the rest here. Which aspects, were there any questions, first of all, about the assignments, aspects that are unclear? I make a mentimeter out of this, you know, that's probably more exciting for everyone involved. Let's do some mentimetering. Let's see. I present stuff and hopefully it doesn't explode. Yeah, that wasn't what I want. So let's see. Okay, question one. Ah, oh, you don't see the, um, that's right, I'm learning. Hang on. Um, hides this one. Just to get an overview. Uh, so to see if people are clear and uh, comfortable with the explanations because um, there's always variability. Again, we am trying to emulate reasonably sound, but nevertheless uh, specifications that leave some gaps for interpretation because we don't want to 
have a hundred percent, you know, you, you need to be exposed to sloppiness that real world sometimes has as well. Somewhat is good. Sure is also good. Um, okay, unclear. Yeah, cool. Need to clarify that. Twenty-five. Not sure how many are participating. Oh. I have to save it. Okay, we have a number there, I guess. Cool. I think that's good. So uh, two thirds say, yeah, you know, I kind of know what you want. One third say, yeah, I'm really sure what you want. Um, sometimes being too sure is also risky because they may actually have wrong understanding, but think you got it right. That's the worst possible outcome because don't do that for a bachelor, by the way. Thinking you know what you want to do in your bachelor and going in the wrong direction is nothing worse than this. Rather be clear if you're unclear. Um, yep, okay, cool. I'll take that. Sounds good. Okay. So we got a kind of a bit more than two thirds, I guess. So which aspects are still or still do we need to learn about or still unclear to you? Perhaps just to spell them out. Then I know whether that's something I need to talk about anyway, or is it something that we have talked about that I hadn't been too, <laughs> I knew that would come, uh, hadn't been too explicit about. And uh, of course, um, I've spent the whole weekend awaiting some comment about mainframes, uh, stool machine milieu. As you may imagine. Firebase is unclear? Okay, cool. Um, still to learn. Okay. Invoking web books, yep, testing APIs, good one. Error handling, uh, okay. Good, that's helpful. Um, so, Firebase, my more, more spontaneous response. Um, or perhaps, uh, yeah, um, Firebase, my spontaneous response is that uh, I think I talked a bit about this already. Sure, I forget it myself, but we can entrench that a bit more where needed. But here's the thing. In as far as the use for the assignment goes, I think you would know everything you need to know. So I'll put it this way, because there is uh, generally, mostly the challenges are about connectivity and possibly adding, changing and deleting items from Firebase. Uh, but you don't need to come up with, you know, entirely sophisticated data schemas like you, for example, need to do in uh, databases, right? So yeah, they have a distinct challenge representing domain, all that. Here, you just need to store something, and something means something JSON in the database and be able to retrieve it, right? Remember, no SQL databases allow you to define a schema in an ad hoc way and also in diverse ways. So if you have two collections, they store different things. You can do that quite straightforward. So. Um, I would recommend, uh, first of all, to revisit the code for the Firebase lab or, you know, whatever that was, kind of the, 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 the kind of code demo that I had a few weeks back uh, and see if that uh, sheds a bit of light on, on you and mostly run it, of course. And there are certain, there's an element of homework in there as well that I put, I generally put in the comments ideas for homework that you can do so you can explore it more, extend it more and know why it's running or not running in your way, in your case. And then um, we can use the issue tracker to kind of follow up more the aspects that are unclear. So I know more targeted what I need to talk about more, um, more aspects that are still need to be addressed. The same is to some extent for error handling. Uh, I was under the impression that uh, we talked quite a bit about error handling, especially in a REST context, how you, uh, you know, identify different status codes and uh, the contextual information you want to give and the information you don't want to give. Um, but if there's need, it would also be good to see, you know, an issue that substantiates a bit more like what kind of specific challenges um, uh, related to error handling you are facing. One aspect we haven't talked about is um, HTTP testing at all. That's right. That's something I need to put on your agenda um, to see, you know, how, how we can effectively test those handlers. That's actually not a non-trivial task, but an important one because you kind of want to test that stuff. Uh, I agree. And of course, the main theme is webhooks because we haven't talked about it, but I threw around this term all the time uh, as part of the assignment. So it's not really helpful not to explain it. Okay, so we're converging on those things. Uh, I think, I mean, the, the main takeaways is webhooks testing, uh, um, HTTP testing, of course, and then there's the uh, Firebase and error handling. So again, I would encourage you to look at the Firebase discussion a bit. I know it has been, might have been also um, parallel to your assignment one load. <laughs> so while you were in assignment one, you may not have paid as much attention to the 
um, um, you know, introduction of the themes that we had here. So I'd encourage you to have a look at this. Okay, Susan Tuck, that's helpful. Um, knowing way getting started is good. How, how do you, what do you need to learn about how to get started? Yeah, uh, you know, I think that's the presumption that we make that uh, you kind of have a feel of how to get started. Also urge you to get started reasonably early, at least laying out, playing around with REST APIs. And I would claim again that the baseline um, activity, that is uh, the implementation of the third party APIs, libraries, APIs, <laughs> in, the, um, in the second assignment is probably uh, easier, or same or easier than the first one. Okay, I'll, uh, I, I can work with this. <laughs> I don't know what it means. I do I know what it means. Uh, it's just uh, cool. Um, okay, cool. Sounds good. Very important. Unclear what invocation means. Uh, invocation means basically calling. I mean, that's just the fancy word of saying something is uh, called, right? If you're a web service and something invokes the web service, it makes it sometimes calls the web service. Just the way of using it. I use that all the time. Sorry for that. Oh, uh, you know, now you know what it means, basically. Substitute with calling uh, or, uh, you know, being called or something, and then should make sense. But you find it being used in the, in the, in the, in the uh, literature more, more generally. Yes, what app, app webhooks actually is, an example would be great, exactly. And the fact that mainframe belongs to Vipo. I'm not sure if it belongs to any of you guys, uh, to be honest, because this is definitely not a mainframe course. I mean, you're seriously in the wrong course, to be honest. That was like a, you know, one generation back cloud understanding kind of things. But let's, 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 let's go with it. Uh, invocation, error handling, yeah. Um, oh yeah, the war has begun. Uh, lead, that's right, yeah, yeah. Small frame, yeah. frame, that's not something, is it? I don't know. Something every time I read those comments, I'm not sure anymore if I should teach this course here. Um, anyway, um, okay, ah, okay, that's good. So we're on the same page. Perhaps we're in the wrong course, who knows? Um, okay, can we use other APIs in the assignment? Uh, for the assignment, I would, uh, well, if you flip, I would tend for no. The reason is mostly that we don't have comparability. So we do review again, of course, number one. So people see other stuff being used. Also, I can't guarantee that you also all have to change or comparable challenge level. It would be very unfair if you find an API that has literally implemented what you're supposed to implement, linking the COVID cases with you know policy uh, measures and so on. So uh, I would say no. Um, what you can use, however, if you want to use other third party libraries, but even that I discourage um, because for the reasons that I put into the assignment text now, I should have done it for the first assignment as well, because I saw a lot of uses of Gorilla Max and so on, uh, where there's absolutely no, no real need to, given the limited complexity of the assignment. The reason is mostly that you inherit the technical debt right on their side. So it's something you'd be watchful of, but you can do it, of course. Um, but it's not something we expect, in fact. Uh, we, for now, we expect you to do it independently for the future. Uh, for the project that follows afterwards, we expect you to be moving more out there and you can try all kind of frameworks and uh, break your programming necks along the way. Okay. How many extra views uh, how to save my grade? Depends on your grade, uh, to be honest. I mean, if you, if you succeeded with your submission in the first place, you probably don't need extra views. Okay. Um, I leave it at this because uh, I'm not entirely sure if it's course related at this stage, even though I like the fact that you engage with the course, or at least 18 of you. Cool. Okay, I know where to, where, where, where to go, so it was quite good guidance here. Um, um, hang on, I need to hide the video panel again. Okay, let's get to it, webhooks. Um, because that was literally the main talk of the day today, just to get you going on this one. We have a lot of topics that we need to cover. I usually list them at the end of our course list, so I'm um, as you see, I'm not prescriptive in terms of the, you know, specific date when we talk about what, because I kind of take a bit agile depending on the needs are to some extent, but also my own progress here, because I don't like it to be fast, right? So if I don't make it finish this, this session, then it will spill over the next one and so on. Um, so one of the topics is, of course, webhooks. As you have seen, especially in the uh, latter part, the first part of your assignment is probably reasonably clear. I hope up to here you should be fine, but then roughly halfway down, it becomes ugly. 
right? So there's something about webhooks and, you know, what are those beasts and how do you do it? The rest should be reasonably clear again. That's pretty much straightforward or what we do. Okay, let's talk a bit about webhooks. Who has heard about webhooks before? I do it in an oral sense. Good. Two people, two online. How many people? Are there someone raised their hands? That's very physical. I mean, the online ones. Um, <laughs> is there, um, can anyone see the chat or um, the participation list? It's something a bit challenging here. Now in your chat. Okay, two people. So let's say uh, th th there is a very limited insight at this stage. Cool. Let's let's change this a bit. So up to now, the kind of interaction that you used. What kind of interaction did we use? Um, you know, with services that we external services that we use. What was the interaction like? Right. Now mostly get requests. Normal one, and then always. You did it kind of in a, in a, in a demand-based form. Oh, I need this information now. Let me get it, right? So I get the information, you work with this, right? Okay, easy. Quite straightforward, right? So we work with this. Um, what are the challenges there with this kind of approach? Of what? So yeah, you have, to get, you have to make the request. You make the request. It's always the responsibility is always on the client side, right? You need to figure out when you want this information. You need to figure it out. But okay, why can't we do it on the client side? In the end, we're using it. What would be a reason to do change to, to have something initiated from the server? So why? I mean, you could say you know you're writing the client, right? You're using third party APIs, right? Why shouldn't you also then take the responsibility of requesting for everything? Why, why, what would be a reason for the server to take the initiative to start, uh, you know, uh, sharing information? It's a catch question, of course. Uh, I don't know, maybe you, the user wouldn't be prepared for it, or? Mm -hmm. so, like, like, why wouldn't you? Well, one argument that is often made when it's about decentralization is uh, scalability, right? Because if the server has too much load, right, the server is always responsible, then it centralizes the system and it kind of creates a bottleneck. So you could just say, hey, you clients deal with this. You, when you want re information, request it from me, right? But let's think about more from a, from a, not from a network, but from an application point of view. Why is it useful to have sometimes server-side initiated interaction? No, it's a client again, right? So client wants to uh, kind of access something and then to authenticate. I mean, you know, the server wouldn't say, please authenticate. And the client says, hey, what do you want from me? I don't want anything from you, right? So, I mean, there needs to be some demand for it, right? But what would be a good application case where you need server-side notifications? Uh, just like, um, just going to the exchange app, like, you know, like when we have a certain rate that's like really good, yeah. and you want to know about it. Yeah. Goes to a certain amount. Yeah. Oh, I want to make exchanges. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's a perfect example, right? So it's always when the server side information changes and it's of interest to the client to register that change, right? It's not enough to know, oh, cool, tomorrow it's, you know, plus two degrees. Today was minus five. That's something I can, you know, keep demand based. Yes, you could, sure. Please notify me when the future temperature rises above 21 degrees. So that would be an interesting query. Sure, you could implement it. How many of you really feel the demand for this uh, average? However, if you see, you know, US dollar was Norwegian krona price or Euro Norwegian krona price, you kind of may be interested because that may affect your holiday planning or whatever else or investment in stocks. I don't know. Right. So um, and so that could be it's completely sensible. So from a trading point of view, particular, it's very useful um, aspect. Right. So if you subscribe to something, you follow, for example, um, um, if you think about blocks, you follow your favorite poster or Instagram, uh, and you want to be notified when someone actually posts a new image that shows off the beautiful lifestyle in Dubai or I don't know whatever else. Um, so, uh, or of course, in a new block entry uh, uh, related to Golang necessarily, who would look for anything else, right? In this sense, I guess. Anywho, so it's always every time you want to be notified when server side information or state changes, right? So that's where something else comes in. And that's where webhooks come in. And they're not like the thing, they're more like a concept, an abstract concept. And the main difference is there that uh, they're basically what we refer to as callbacks, 
Right, so did you hear about callbacks before in some other context? Not yet? Object orientation, object orientation, design patterns. Did you talk about that anyway? I don't know, I'm just asking. It's more information than anything else. No is a perfectly valid answer. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. Good. Yeah. So that was, I mean, I'm, I'm on, on Olympia, but you register a callback, and when something happens that you registering for, you get notified. Right? Is that yeah, it? So, uh, the callback function, you don't always get an answering. Yeah. So uh, it's sent later. Good. Yeah. So it's kind of an example of asynchronous. So the question, the comment was, by the way, I'm supposed to read for the camera. Of course, uh, is that in web technologies, there was an example of webhook registration, right? So something where you're registering for a piece of information and you get later at some stage, not immediately. That's the beauty of the this kind of, you know, poll request that we do. We, you know, we, we send something, get immediate response. But no, you're expecting something or hope to expect something in the future, right? So it's this uh, asynchronicity problem or challenge because you now need to deal with state distribution, right? So you're registering something to a server you kind of need to know eventually I'm going to get called, but I have no clue when, as opposed to the simple approach when I just request something, get something in response, done, dusted, right? So the REST approach is quite straightforward here, or at least the standard REST approach, right? User-defined HTTP callbacks. And you can literally, if you don't uh, uh, conceptualize what it is, think about a phone call where you are calling an insurance company or a power company to get better rates, and they call you back in two days because they need to figure out what the current rates are, what they want to offer you, or whatever else, right? So it's kind of a registration of an obligation on someone else's behalf, and you need to be ready to see if your phone is ringing and if someone is actually picking up. So it obliges you to some extent, but more important, the other person. Okay, so classically used in web applications, so spot on the example, uh, the, the kind of idea of using... Um, Callbacks. The key difference is there that uh, you know two abstract forms of callbacks, as you find in many frameworks, also programming language frameworks, um, is that of course HTTP based, right? We use HTTP as a protocol that's kind of um, sh shared across all the different APIs and concepts that you have learned here, be GraphQL, REST, and of course the callbacks that you could uh, define for either. So it's related to REST methodology. We we know all this. Um, and the key idea is basically uh, we're using, you know, the classical methods as we know them. The uh, only the, the, the key ingredients here is basically that we specify an event that we want to be notified on on the sender side, right? So I want to be notified when the exchange rate between US dollar and Norwegian krona exceeds. Oh God, now I'm, I'm out of Olympia. Let's say five. I don't know. You name it. I don't know what the exchange rate is right now. So whatever. So you know, uh, some some value in any case. Um, so you're specifying the event of desire, uh, of desire on the client side, you will probably see already, hey, hang on, this is not generic, right? You need to kind of define what currency probably is, what, you know, uh, a threshold is and all that kind of stuff. So this will always need to be um, implemented in a domain specific fashion, right? It's just the idea, the conceptual idea. Then you need to provide the server, currency exchange, with a, think about a hook. And when I say hook, what I mean is basically a URL to be invoked when the event that you're interested in happens. Talking about invoking again means calling effectively, right? So yeah, that's the hook, the web hook. So you're giving a URL basically and say when the exchange rate between Norwegian Kroon and USD dollar USD exceeds that threshold or goes below that threshold or whatever else, really the criteria is really up to the application to define. Call this web hook at this particular address. And you know, provide me with this following information. So that's the idea there. Of course, we need to have know how the payload looks like. That's always application specific. There's no generic way. People sometimes think about webhooks as yet another IETF specification. No, it's just a clever combination of the technology that you know about already, and just you know, redefine it yourself. There are frameworks for this, of course, but I think the exercise here is that you guys do it, try it uh, yourself. So that's the idea. And then when the event happens, it's effectively invoked right so some what are typical application cases timing so sometimes um uh, you know you, you have a you're waiting a certain deadline bidding right i mean in fin i don't know does fin do bidding actually yeah. or only selling yeah that's bidding. Uh, like 
like eBay as well, right? Uh, okay, yeah. cool. So if you, have, for example, have a bidding process, you want to be notified if there's a higher bid than yours, for example, right, on a particular product you're interested in. So, you know, that would be a classical case, uh, exchange rates notification and so on. Continuous integration is another important case. So you're lodging a commit and you want to have downstream deployment testing automated or whatever else, right? Sure, you don't want to, you know, commit something and then afterwards uh, send some HTTP requests to ensure that something is tested and deployed. That should be automated, right? Um, and then there's various services that allow actually for this kind of integration, like issue tracking is another one, uh, the tickers we talked about, and of course service monitoring as well um, that you can do can be in both ways for different reasons. Anywho, um, yeah, so diverse use cases are quite quite diverse. So just to review the principles and the contrast to what you did so far abstractly is you to 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 this stage you used largely the polling request, right? We have a server, the server provides an endpoint. Cool or n endpoints, who cares, right? That way you score with a simple one, simple one endpoint uh, idea here. And uh, we have clients, one or more clients, n clients, that's the idea. And then you have one request and you get a response, right? So super straightforward. Give me all the exchange rates for knock, and then there you go, right? So all the exchange rates come. Guess what? That's not JSON, that's just me mocking stuff up, but you get the gist, right? So there's some communication going on. That's the polling principle request response principle right so very general the counterpart is the publish subscribe principle and that's the one that webhooks use and that's the same for iss feeders do you guys still know those things iss feeds or is it something i need to ask the last generation really cool you see them everywhere online but nobody uses them anymore right they're out aren't they just like that little button right next to you. that's right that there's a button there that's cool what does that button do yeah. Um, so now, but fundamentally, the idea is there that they basically have a you know a structured representation of, for example, a website. Let's say if you're running, for example, uh, WordPress, you have blocks there, right? It kind of provides a XML version, more or less standardized XML version of the content, or at least the headers, so you can quickly pull this and integrate it into third-party services. So you can say hey, those are the new you know blog posts be published on Golang Doc org slash block or whatever else just by subscribing to his rss feed yeah that's the idea there right so it's a it's a cheap way of kind of getting content without presentation so anyway um not the best example so um oh it is my side so publish subscribe principles it's really about you signaling that you're interested in something again same scenario server let's say a server has multiple endpoints doesn't need to have but i just make it here for the example uh yeah it could be more, right? So I call one endpoint registration and the other one invocation, right? So, and then we have end, uh, clients that are really interested in what they're doing. They actually want to bid on, they want to buy Bitcoins, put it this way, right? So, I mean, that's the whole thing right now. Please tell me that's not a thing of last generation already. You still know about that, right? So, what is Bitcoin? exactly. <laughs> I was sharing that. Let's say a random digital currency. And if, yeah, I don't know. Um, anyway. Um, the, the idea is there you want to subscribe to, 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 to you know, some notification in the widest sense. So the end clients want to do that. They basically say, hey, I'm interested in that exchange rate or in that Bitcoin price or whatever else. Register me here on the server and then let me know. So it's kind of something like that, right? So you send a notification. And what does the server do? Well, it actually registers a webhook, a webhook. And the webhook is provided by the client. The client itself says, please notify me under this address. Yeah? Bit like if you have your house address or your, your, your flat right now in SRT, right? So you have your flat and you are expecting a package, and you can say to the post office, please deliver that package to that address, the providing address, because it needs to come from you. Same here, right? The webhooks, let's say it's called slash notification with all that host prefix, local host, 8080, whatever, it doesn't matter. But let's use that one. Cool, sorted. What happens then? Well, then there's some sort of update on the server side. Right. Either the server does it itself by invocating, invoking yet another service, calling yet another service, uh, you know, or perhaps even providing the service itself, being the exchange, unlikely but possible, or you know, perhaps another trigger such as something else uh, invokes the service. So, for example, assuming this is the continued continuous integration service, um, and there's suddenly a git commit that is actually submitted, then this could trigger the web service itself. You know, it itself could subscribe to events, right? So here's some updates, basically says some third party clients making it up and then the server finally commits to the registered webhooks and invokes now the client on its endpoint 
with this updated information, right? Or whatever it wants to provide as part of this. For example, yeah, I got updated rates. I said, okay, your threshold for uh, you know uh, bidding has been exceeded, or the you know Bitcoin um, USD has uh, exceeded a certain exchange rate. You name it, any of that. So that's the idea. So slightly more complex, but conceptually the same. Uh, a general or quite general principle. It always combines concepts of um, REST services, right? Because the registration is, of course, a pull request. It says, you know, do something on the server. The server says, yeah, sure, I'm doing it. Oh, well done. Sounds good. Then the server, sorry, then the third party says, hey, I have an update here, right? And that's probably like a post or whatever else, I don't know, to the server endpoint. And then the server immediately responds to that one as well. Yes, yeah, sure, I received your trigger. Sounds good, right? So it's very primitive, comp those polling requests, those ad hoc requests. And then the server now does the same as well. For the third time, it basically says now, here's the notification, please, you know, get the updated rates, whatever else, right? So think about this publish subscribe principle as a composition of this more simple principle. Yeah, so it's, uh, but they're usually seen as um, um, two complementary approaches. So here the idea is really that the server takes responsibility for initiating connections upon registration, otherwise they wouldn't know about, you know, the client. Um, whereas in the first case, it's always the client polling uh, whenever information is needed. Does that make sense? Or has anyone any question? It's perfectly sensible to have questions because that's a very high level principle, straightforward, but super generic. Uh, and when I say generic means across courses, you will definitely see that again in some other technology somewhere else. Even operating systems, for example. Could principle do that there. Uh, anyway, so those are high level patterns. Was that my machine? Oh, no. Good. Um, okay, cool. All right, let's bring it back. So just some argumentation, um, you know, trade offs. Now we have the simple polling approach, interaction, very classical API. You have done it like a lot of times now, so you should have certain experience with this one, right? So it's always the same idea. The client polls repeatedly, the server provides functionality, done. Response to you with the client generally, right? What are the challenges? Oh, I put them there. I wanted you to tell them to me, but perhaps I'm checking the ones that can read. So <laughs> what are the challenges? Perhaps you come up with other ones. So one of the obvious ones is of course rate limits. Uh, you know, if you poll for, ex I mean, you could alleviate the concern of being notified, right, about the USD NOx exchange rate by polling every <laughs> constantly, right? You most certainly get eventually uh, hit your threshold and say, yeah, cool, sell or buy, whatever you want to do, right? But by the definition, you waste a lot of, uh, uh, it's very inefficient, right? A lot of bandwidth is wasted because you're constantly polling. And in fact, you know, the one that is best just before this uh, distributed denial of service attack gets you know the latest response and gets actually you know uh, has, makes the best deal so basically by bringing server performance down you probably perform best which is super not desirable and super not intentional so especially when it's about you know uh, popular um, uh, um, you know um, deadline service points whatever I don't know uh, any sort of events then it will be problematic to do this so rate limits connection limits here again uh, and then there's the other with uh, timing and timeouts. Yeah, you don't necessarily know if you get a response, then something times out because server is not responding as fast as you want. And also, if you're interested in precise timing, it becomes problematic because you want to assume that oh, every midnight at 12 o'clock, uh, the server probably gets a currency update. And then you kind of, on a client side, need to time this somehow. And you can't rely on the fact that it's really precise. You know, you may be off, you may be slightly too late, some others earlier, then, and, you know, it becomes just messy. And webhooks, they basically have the opposite. They say, hey, you know, whenever you see an update, send me some information, right? You know, all and out, I'll just wait for you now. I'm not polling you again ever. How clean is that, right? So, I mean, you don't have any sort of inefficiency on the wire, right? So no, no further invocation. Only when you feel like, um, I'm, I don't want any updates anymore, like newsletter, you know, unsubscribe me. From, from then on, no interaction anymore. So two interaction by the clients for registration, unregistration. And then all the rest left to the server. And precisely one per event. Or, you know, if the server sends multiple, that is a problem. But in principle, only based on event uh, is any interaction then uh, no, um, provided. So it's very efficient on the wire. What are the problems here? Or are there any problems? Looks like paradise, right? The way I pitched it, please. Uh, well, I mean, I'm assuming uh, if you are looking for a change in the webhooks, you would have to constantly poll or, or perform some sort of 
uh, asynchronous action like a worker or something on the server to keep track of all the webhooks and to potentially send out uh, the information whenever it updates. But it still uses a lot of potentially uh, uh, like server uh, resources. Yes, that's right. So there is load on the server, but not on the network, right? So, because it just re responds to requests passively received, likely, right? But yes, it probably needs to have a timer or, you know, scheduling activities in the widest sense, for example, or data pre-processing or of that kind, right? I agree with you. So there's a lot more responsibility suddenly on the server and most certainly load related. I mean, I mean, in, in simplest way, the server needs to at least have a persistence concept now. In the previous case, assignment one, in memory storage, did you need in memory storage? by at best caching, right? So briefly to store something to a variable, but you, after any call by the client, you could forget about whatever had happened, right? So there was not even a proper in-memory storage need per, per se in any case. But here it becomes quite a bit more tricky, right? Not only do you need to, of course, uh, deal with that uh, storing uh, possible webhooks that are registered, but probably also think about, oh, what happens if, you know, there's uh, downtime, you know, like uh, I need to have a persistence concept to ensure that I get back up on it. What kind of events am I committing to, right? So suddenly, if it's about timing or scheduling, then the server needs to do all that polling, possibly. Completely right. So we actually may uh, induce kind of server-side issues. That's right. So you, it could be, in worst case, that you offload all the obligation to the server, and that's it. So you don't gain much otherwise, right? Other comments, other problems you see. Nothing is beautiful, right? So it's no, oh, right, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, if the um, uh, server side doesn't send anything to the client, how will the client know if it actually is still supposed to get anything? Yeah, that's right. So there's this reliability concept, right? So a question, right? Can the client reliably assume that they it's subscribed and gets notified, right? No. <laughs> is I think the answer. But what you can do, what can you do on the server side to alleviate this concern? Perhaps just schedule blank outputs or? So kind of a heartbeat kind of concept. Is that something you think about? Or, yeah. Uh, this could be one way. So you could the dummy in invocations, especially if invocations are rare, you want to ensure you're still there, you're still subscribed. You could expect dummy invocations. That would be one way. Cool. What would be another way, the cheaper way? It's an open question. Please. And uh, from my understanding of your question, uh, yeah. something like uh, you ask us to implement, uh, so or, or like uh, endpoints uh, where you could, for example, check if the web hook is still active. Exactly. And so you kind of want to have a server side provision now also for the registration, not only for whatever service you're providing, but you want to be able to show, am I still registered? Give them the view of the current webhooks, right? All that kind of stuff, right? And uh, yes, the assignment actually asks for that, right? So that you can show currently registered uh, webhooks in, in one way or another. So that would be, sure, there's no guarantees in life, but at least you know your webhooks in principle still registered. So you want to have facilities uh, of that kind. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. So I think I need to take, uh, no, you, you need to take a break or someone needs to take a break in any case. Um, because I'm running into the four o'clock right now. So uh, let's do a 15 minutes break and then I'm um, conceptualizing a bit more and I'll show you how to do it in practice um, with some code and then could see if we understand the magic altogether or if we think it's not a good idea. It's also not. So see you in 15 minutes.
you don't hear me. Sorry, I was not unmuted. Um, so let's continue where we were. Um, talking a bit about more waxworks. And the idea is to be a bit more uh, practical about it. So let's see. Um, before I get um, carried away, I'll probably just continue sharing my screen. So everything should be running. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, what are the, so we talked a bit about the principles of classical polling APIs, you know, retreat, uh, request response, and now webhooks, which kind of make the life more beautiful and promise you they do. Well, I'm not sure, but let's, let's go with that. Um, so what do we need to do to kind of implement them? A few things. Um, you suddenly need to think about two perspectives um, in, in, in the context of um, web services. You need to think more about the, client server and the you know service providing server the one that you're actually invoking so what does the client now need to provide suddenly that it wouldn't need in the request response case what do we need on the client Previously, the client would just invoke and get you know information back when it wants. Cool. And now, what do you need to be able to do on the client side? Sorry. Uh, I mean, for, uh, in regard to webhooks. Yeah. I suppose re register the webhooks, delete them, edit them, like. Yeah. So that, the, exactly. I mean, uh, the response was you register the webhooks, of course, the functionality. But more challenging, you also need to have a service that is accessible, right? So right now, you use the as of now, you use the exchange rate service and the country service, which are hosted somewhere on the web, right? But your service, where did that, that thing run? On Heroku, of course, but also where did it run else? On your local machine, right? So it doesn't need to provide any sort of facility. It doesn't need to be accessible from the outside. Right? Because no, because we're not subscribing to anything. The thing is here with the public subscribe model is that you also need to be reachable. It's no longer just enough to say, hey, I want information when the stock is change, changing, whatever else, right? Because then you need to tell the system, okay, how are you reachable anyway? And you know, guess what? You're hidden behind the NTU. And you know, you have probably have to I have a private IP address anyway uh, from, from NTNU, and that's not reachable by the public internet. So point is, your client service needs to be exposed to the internet directly and also be able to, you know, um, serve a particular request, right? That's the challenge. Please. Isn't that well, what you can do with like a Heroku instance? Yep, you can. Absolutely. So Heroku uh, would, would offer that facility. I just want to highlight it because you will not necessarily have the ability to run it locally as locally as you did for debugging this and developing in the first place, right? That makes sense. Right? You could run it on your machine would have the same functionality as on Heroku, right? Please say yes, please say yes, because it should. If it's not, then we're in trouble then. Cool. So with this one, no longer as easy, right? Because you need to kind of deploy even the calling service the one that wants to get registered notified in some way that it actually can get notified right so slightly different there so that's one of the main differences we need to bear in mind those two perspectives because what does it mean in practice is that this invoking service also becomes a service right it's no longer just a client that you hack around or postman or whatever else which is just a dumb client if you like that right? because it just bluntly sends whatever you give it no you also need to have a you know service that is actually able to retrieve and process uh, or receive rather and process data. Okay, so okay, and what do we need to do else? Well, we uh, need to now dis decide or define two ways of um, interaction between those services. One is for registration. How do I get my webhook registered on that server? So it calls me back, and possibly deregistered as well. So always remember about that side. People always think about the registration, but they never think about deregistration, uh, which is of course an important point as well. We need things for this of course we need an endpoint that you use for registration in the example i just showed you before i made a dedicated endpoint for for you know illustrative version where I say, uh, purposes where i say hey use this endpoint for registration and use this endpoint for external invocation whatever else it could be the same one as well but i just wanted to make it somewhat conceptually clear 
Um, see if I'm probably should aim more towards the panel so people see what I'm pointing to when I do so. Um, okay, so yeah, so that's that's the uh, main point there. So we need to have a registration way of of dealing with this. Um, we have conditions for invocation, of course, that we need to deal with, and the um, the invocation. So the server needs to now not only be able to uh, uh, receive information on this, uh, you know, like um, get updates on the server side and so on, but it needs to interact with the client, something we didn't deal with either, because the server would just respond, right? It would never need to write a request to the client, always a response, right? You always had handlers and that deal with it. Um, okay, and then of course we have the actual invocation, right? You know, what's, what's when an update is provided, exchange rates or bidding process or whatever, weather update, who names, who knows? or uh, emergency information, you know, from monitoring and so on. And um, that's something that needs to be specified separately because it's highly domain specific or application specific, of course. Cool. Um, yeah, security. So what is an obvious issue with this approach? Anyone? Uh, I suppose, uh you have to watch out such that uh, someone else cannot, let's say, create the effort for you or that is your effort. Yeah, number one. Yeah, that's a good point. And what's the other uh, security challenge? So yeah, what, 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 what uh, was said here, sorry, I'll repeat it for the camera. Uh, the idea is to en ensure some server-side uh, security features to uh, ensure that no one else can register on your behalf, for example, right? Other webhooks that actually are linked somehow to you think about authentication and so on so there are those provisions or perhaps you should have authentication in the first place for registration um that said here's the uh, uh announcement uh, the, the the point for the assignment you will not necessarily need to but it's something you want to be bear in mind in general uh so you got the registration process but not in all instances i mean if you subscribe to a newsletter you don't necessarily need authentication for that you just say hey notify me on this email address i don't care about the rest right so it depends a bit on the application but what's the other risk Think about the client as well. I mean, it's just, yeah. To some extent, yeah. And what specifically? I mean, you know, think about the payload. What, what, what does the client uh, register? You need to register UI, right, for interaction, right? So when you say, hey, please notify me here, it's like giving your house address basically to a third party through a stranger, right? So, and then they have know your house address. Sorry, what's that? Um, I may have anticipated. Um, uh, to, to, you know, you would not necessarily give your, your information to a complete stranger and hoping they're not showing up on your doorstep. You kind of want to ensure that this information is, first of all, secret or at least not guessable. And this at least not guessable is sometimes good enough in, in many instances, at least on the web. Right, so you know that concept very much so that you get URL endpoints that are simply not guessable based on the complexity, right? So uh, largely the idea of losing the uh, security by obscurity principle, which is not a brilliant idea in any case, but it would at least be authentication free, right? So you just say, hey, you get a, such a cryptic URL that it's next to unguessable in any case. Of course, someone can sniff, you know, traffic on, on intermittent uh, routes and whatever else hopped, uh, um, hops on 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 the um, the track to you if you like and i can figure it out but uh, looking at your server alone it would be next to impossible to guess what's going on so that's the idea for example here the webhook structure of slack you guys know slack please or is that also the last generation thing no okay so um discord is i'm uh, on olympia i think discord does a similar i forgot actually um anyway look the dust yet changes sometimes a bit but in slack that's literally how it's done how it's done right they provide you an endpoint say hey this is a webhook you can invoke with whatever you want cool well done okay so um yep so the other is um using a kind of a hash based me uh, message authentication so the idea is basically there that you have some some sort of shared secret that you share in advance server and client and based on this you calculate in hash and that can be used for kind of you know validating if it's 
uh, embedded in the payload, for example, uh, and not visible from you know along the transport path, of course. But it can also just be used to create this. Uh, so it's not entirely obscure, I guess. But this uh, um, uh, hash that you can append to your URL and use this as an identifier in the widest sense. So it's kind of a medium level of uh, security, of course. But better than just have an open uh, you know, um, um, service.org slash notification kind of endpoint that everyone can invoke by just you know, trying randomly on the web. So there's that, there's that bit as well. We talk about this a bit more. There are, of course, advanced authentication mechanisms like OAuth and so on. Uh, but then it becomes really heavy because then even the server needs to authenticate with the client and all that kind of stuff. So that's a bit heavy and not too commonly used uh, in the uh, in, in, in open public services at this stage. Um, just an example here, for example, uh, yeah, just to motivate this a bit, um, is here that the um, idea is basically that uh, you know if you're having some payload um, that this payload is basically um, stringified and then basically uh, hashed um, as part of the um, to generate the signature that is accompanying a particular message so here for example you would have a webhook id um, we will use it slightly different though but there's a webhook id uh, and you would embed in the signature actually the payload uh, based on which then uh, the, the client uh, can verify that this is actually a message that was encoded, right? Ensuring integrity alongside the transmission and so on. Anyway, I don't want to overdo this. I rather want to motivate the idea of Slack, uh, sorry, not Slack, but webhooks in the first place. So let's use Slack as an example, because you all know that. Um, and um, we can just have a look at this briefly. Just see how quickly or not we can actually use this. Bring it back to the documentation. So, I mean, of course, generally what you need to do is in your application, they need to enable this endpoint in the first place, right? So it generates an incoming web webhook. Um, and then generally, so there would be something of that kind here. So that would be a typical Slack webhook, if you like. And then you need to know not only about the endpoint that's invoked, of course, but also the structure in which the message is expected. And this is completely dependent on the service you're using, right? There's no standard structure for that. I just want to be clear about this. So messages are again in territory of design. So they need to be provided by the provider in this instance here, right? So we, what it does it expect? Well, guess what? It needs to always be a post request. Get one work. It needs to have the content type application JSON likely embedded in the header. I'm wondering if it, if it actually tests for this. Sometimes they just say they do, but they actually don't. And then, of course, the payload at the bottom, right? And if that's not satisfied, guess what? The invocation is not going to happen, right? So let's just exemplify it. Um, so I have a very cheap example, just to be very, very quick and so how easy it actually is. So I have a, I have a workspace cloud, or cloud technology, and then I have a, a notification channel in there, uh, if you like. And then uh, it's very straightforward to actually go into the um, workspace settings please don't explode Good. so um uh that's actually not quite what i might meant see. Ah, yeah, that's me. So hang on, let's see, not the workplace builder, which I want to manage abs. It's under abs in the meantime. Yeah, so, and there you have the notion of integrations, as they call it. And there's basically just a lot of different apps that can link to other um, systems, such as uh, bug tracking systems, GitHub, uh, whatever else. It's kind of pre-configured if you like webhook concept often they always they are sometimes a bit more business logic but what we're interested in is of course just a way of invoking things so in one of those custom integrations is basically the webhooks configuration what what do you do basically is quite straightforward so now for a given organization so it was this cloud organization that i have here right cloud technologies as you see um there is uh, one simple configuration in there uh, and that's basically you know, linking the channel notifications, of course, could change that if I wanted to. 
as an inter incoming webhook, right? So how does it look like in practice? Quite straightforward. What's the, what's the channel you're interested in? So there are multiple ones. So no, don't necessarily want to change that. Let's stick to notifications. Here's the notification endpoint. I just copy URL. Um, and then you can describe, yeah, whatever. That, that's all customizing uh, stuff. But that's how easy it actually is in the context of Slack, for example. So, so now we would be in a position to say, hey, um, you know, let's just try this out. And what does it mean? Well, we open post then, I guess. No? There we are. Just minimize this a bit, perhaps get a bit of a better interaction going on. Um, and we wanted a post request, otherwise it's not going to happen. We need the uh, entire um, endpoint there. So let's see how many weird messages I'm going to get on that one soon. Um, and then we need to have a body, right? So it needs to be a post request with a um, body. So let's go back to our, I'm gonna do this cheap and just copy and paste the um, content here. So the default structure, for example, is, is this one, right? So it's quite straightforward. Where is it? Body, this one. Uh, post to this endpoint, post, let's see if it explodes. Okay, it says okay. It's, that's not actually scary. Um, 200. A status code and then the corresponding response let's look in the app and guess what there is something happening right hello world on the incoming webhook so that's how easy it's in principle right so that the, the webhook idea so it um, should be quite flexible and adaptable so another one to a concept okay that's the famous slack noise get used to it um okay so that would be the integration so if you think about it now it actually makes it super easy to kind of integrate third party applications from your application right the only thing you need to do is create a post request on the right endpoint with the right structure right so quite straightforward so um and then of course there are very um there are variable uh, levels of more complexity uh for example if you want advanced formatting of your of your request i just uh, they have something like this here um just to show how it looks like i just sent it in so this is completely specific of course to the application right be clear about this it's not uh, in any way standardized whatsoever so i'm just saying brace yourself for impact there you go um and uh you know this for example uh, you know this this is other um structure there for example uh, embed features such as additional fields as far as I understand, uh, URLs can be embedded. Um, what else can we have? We can have uh, different formatting features that are um, there as well, sub subdividing in sections, um, the, the, the text and so on as they did here and so on, right? But this is of course completely specific to the application that you're using. I'm just exemplifying that it's kind of open-ended and allows you to be simple or complex, uh, however, however you feel like. So nothing much to um, concern there. Um, okay, so I think at this stage, it's probably sensible to kind of, um, yeah, I'm not doing the production use aspects, kind of to motivate a bit more what it means for our uh, perspective. So let's um, see if we have a bit of time left. Yes, I do. So let's try. Maybe we can motivate now, or else I continue, uh, or I will continue on Wednesday anyway. So to kind of demo this a bit, and uh, first words, uh, first things first, all the demos we provide, they are there for a purpose. They're not just, you know, um, complementing our teaching and providing access to the documents, but actually you can actually use them for your own inspiration as well, right? You think, okay, how do I approach this principle, that problem, right? Oftentimes you find some starting points in the material that we have in lecture, including like the GraphQL uh, um, Go script that um, uh, Siamak prepared for us is now also uploaded as well, and Firebase and all those things. So if there are issues with those concepts, review those code snippets. I mean, they are in principle all working and should be reasonably well documented. If not, post an issue and then we'll uh, need to deal with this. So, okay, let's briefly just um, have a look at how about the simple of a simple service that we can possibly think about. So what this here models is precisely the service you just saw in the slides before, right? Remember, hosting web service has two endpoints. One of them says, ah, register something on it. Well, I guess we need to have a client that registers some, some interest or whatever else. Then there's a third party invocation right now, and I will emulate it with Postman, why not? 
And upon this trigger, the server will actually invoke the client again. So that's the whole concept that I'm going to model here and see um, if that makes sense. So that's what I'm going through now a bit. So this is basically this webhooks demo. Again, you find it in the repo. Feel free to download and instantiate it. It should work out of a box. You just need to follow the, uh, in the read. There's a readme in there that says uh, how to actually run this um, properly because there's actually two main files, two, two, two executables in there for uh, yeah, convenience reasons, I guess. Okay, let's look at the main one. This is the actual main service. What does it do? Well, there's no magic up here. You all know this stuff, um, but it basically offers two um, webhook endpoints, right? So, uh, or two handlers, if you like. One is called webhook handler. The other one is called service handler. One is for registration, handling all the webhooks it receives. The other one is actually doing the service facility that it's supposed to do. So let's have a look briefly into those um, handlers because they should be here. Patients, there we go. All right, so the first one, so here, what do we have? So this is just, uh, you know, to sort out the handlers. Here's a nice example of modularity where you actually offload all structure, you know, logic in a way uh, into a dedicated Go file and leave only the main function more or less isolated in the, in the uh, command directory. Um, so we have a, a collection of webhooks. Those are webhook registrations and it's like super straightforward. And in fact, you want it, there, there will be great opportunities for improving this. Um, but what it fundamentally does is effectively allowing for two functions. One of them is to register incoming webhooks, number one, and the other one is to um, retrieve existing webhooks. So that's the whole idea about this um, this handler here. So how do how do webhooks need to look like? Of course, again, as I made the point earlier, was that the uh, structure of the post, the content of it is uh, application specific and it's of course the case here as well so how do webhooks look like let's have a look ah okay so they're here in the structs.go for example referenced here and they have this following structure generally it's a json containing two keys one is url the other one is event and they can hold whatever they want here really it's just for illustration purposes they can be arbitrarily complex or simple as you saw in the rest uh, sorry in the slack example right so very simple one for the event more complex one with all those formatting features and so on. So, but here we keep it uh, on the simple side. So let's see if I, forgive me if I muck around with the mouse, it's mostly because of my, the video panels in that way. Okay, so what happens? Well, when we receive such uh, content via a post, via the webhook handler that was um, initiated um, in the, um, instantiated in the main function, then we'll pass this first. First of all, of course, we go for the method. We should have a method post that signals, okay, you please register the webhook. Um, and then we're creating a new um, the webhook instance. We decode the JSON that we get, right? So that's the request body is decoded into the webhook reference. And uh, we append this to our webhook collection, basically, right? So we kind of uh, keep track of this, super simple. And I basically just give feedback. That's what's happening. And it signals, uh, well, you know, something has been created and also prints out in the, um, in the payload effectively um, the index of the web that has been created in collection. So super straightforward. No magic there. Um, so the other thing that it supports is get. And um, that is um, super straightforward because what it literally does, it doesn't look at any sort of input it gets other than checking for the uh, rest method but it just encodes the entire webhooks as it is and spots spits it out to the client right so it's more like for diagnostic purposes anyone who is remotely related or has remotely any understanding of programming would think yeah that's not necessarily a super clever idea because it exposes a lot of system internals there right so uh, of course you would want to filter this more and kind of limit it but the idea is to show the functionality at its purest uh, as opposed to um, having a refined um, kind of production ready example Okay, so that's the handler for registration. Sounds good so far, I can live with this. And uh, perhaps we can just run this thing and show how it works, so at least the registration bit, and then we'll work a bit to the linkage on the client. Let's run this first and see if it explodes. If yes, then you have a laugh and I have homework. Oh no, cool, it kind of seems to work. Um, there we go, right? So, so if you run this, there's a bit of uh, docu support. So you also kind of see how you actually can make use of it, right? So there's two endpoints. One is webhook. The other one is a, a, a service for, for the emulated service invocation. 
If you feel like those names are not really well geared, feel free to change the, them here, their constants here. So you have the liberty to kind of do that um, as well. Okay, let's look at this beast a bit. So we have this webhook uh, thing, and let's say we want to register a, uh, um, a webhook. Um, let's use Postman for now. Of course, that's not really happening because Postman cannot actually, um, you know, um, listen to exp listen to responses. But we just want to see how that. No, not here, please. I want to see how the registration actually pans out. So let's see. So we have a body. We have a post request. The body is raw, um, and we want to have a URL. Actually, p not that one, but local host. 80 and then uh, that was called webhook singular i think or oh, someone wireless naming conventions that's scary um yes it does not good okay um no, let's send this thing so here it goes cool it says zero right so um you can actually check in the server it has a debug function it says well you know there's a new uh, service that has been registered right localhost 8081 invoked url it can be anything let's change the payload a bit and confuse it um Again, this is just a string. It doesn't check uh, for, for anything particular, right? Could be example.org uh, first web hook. I don't know. So much about creativity, right? So um, let's see. Uh, let's scroll down. Hang on. So there should be a second one. Let's see. That's registered now as well, right? Very simple REST API just for registering stuff and keeping track of it, right? So if you want to view this, we send a GET request to the very same endpoint. Uh, and see what's in there. And the response should read, you know, basically just spit out whatever we have currently in there. And you see, it's literally the structure just dumped uh, back into the uh, response writer in GoLang. So quite straight uh, forward as an example. Okay, so I think that makes sense. No magic there. So that would be the registration in principle, quite simple. So uh, having done that, the aspect is to, of course, the other bit is to look at the client because, uh, hang on, let's look at the, uh, the other handler first, um, the service handler. What does that thing do in this instance? Oh, yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. There we go. All right, service handler. Super easy, again, for illustrative purposes. So that's the second one. Any invocation um, is kind of redirected here to the endpoint uh, service, right? The second one. What does it do when it receives something? Well, first of all, it checks for post requests. It will only deal with post requests. That doesn't matter. You can make it get, make it patch, you name it, right? So that's a constraint that's just artificially introduced. And what will it do then? What is that doing here? Questions to you guys. Please. Have a wild guess uh, goal Yeah, and before that, what was the wild guess what it's doing? Uh, what, what, what's that goal? Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. Well, this, this, this code snippet does in total first. So then we go back to code routine, code routines. It uh, creates uh, separate instances of concurrent running uh, workers. Yeah, that's right. So it iterates through all the webhooks we have registered, right? Two in our world right now, not many. Slightly sad, but you know, and then it um, um, you know it, it, it um, calls them right in a way, right? It makes a uh, call to uh, call URL. Let's have a look at it. Look at this one first before we get back to this uh, Go routines business. But um, the idea is basically that uh, it calls the URL with a string, right? So, uh, sorry, the URL itself with some sort of content, which is a string. It sends a post request. It embeds the content basically bluntly, uh, and just happens and sees what you know, hopes for the best, I guess, checks for errors and uh, prints every res any response. So that's the server side still, right? The server invokes the webhook that has been registered, the client, right? And it just basically signals what the client has sent back. So quite straightforward. But here, what has been mentioned here uh, is this is called, but this is not only called, but there's this prefix go, right? Uh, and this was, I'm, I was on the impression that Marsh had talked about it perhaps, or at least briefly at some stage earlier. But what does that do? Well, this ensures uh, an asynchronous invocation or a parallel invocation uh, of the uh, function. So it creates a new thread effectively. 
uh, or no, that's that's a bit strong. Go routines, as they're called. You know them as threat from elsewhere, roughly equivalent conceptually, and uh, calls this particular function. Question: Why does it do it? Why don't we just iterate over all the different um, webhooks that we have and call them in the usual way? Which is saying go routine. Would work as well, right? My assistant fell asleep. So sad. Um, why do we do this Go business in front of it? Just because we want to claim more Go territory? Or use that term more as often as possible? Yeah, please. What's in the chat? Then you need to wait for each call to the Correct. Right. So uh, the response, uh, just see my grade out the response. I just read to the camera back. Uh, then you need to read out the. Um, uh, uh, sorry, you need to wait the end, uh, uh, the invocation of each call before the next. Right. So you kind of need to. Uh, you have sequential execution mode. Right. So basically, your whole web server is blocked by waiting for timing, uh, 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 for a call that possibly times out. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Um, that would definitely be a bit of a challenge. Let's see if we can emulate this. Um, uh, by making a call to service, we need to have a post request. I think it will not work in our favor because none of them is actually reachable. So I'll see what happens now. Yeah, see if it's, uh, ah, okay, no, it just explodes. That's cool. Uh, yep, yeah, it's... Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> don't use example.org, that thing actually exists. Uh, and we got a nice 404 from that one. Uh, and um, the other one just exploded, I guess. Anyway, I registered an invalid webhooks, of course, right? The system now bluntly tries to invoke them. Let's see how that goes. But uh, what, what you would see, and it's just too fast to kind of see uh, anything meaningful, is that this is done sequentially. I mean, assuming you have 100 webhooks subscribed, right? It would go one after the other, right? Before, in, instead of going parallel. Just by using go routines, that's as cheap as just saying go and then uh, the function afterwards. It does it in parallel. Um, note, of course, go routines has all the challenges um, that happen there associated with concurrency. If you want to synchronize on state, right? So you want to kind of, and you know, uh, integrate, for example, the results made by different calls and so on. You would also need to think about, um, you know, synchronization problems, which we're not looking at here right now. So the calls are basically independent. Just say, deal with this call, send it off, I don't forget. And if things things go sideways, I kind of don't care, right? So that's at least the intuition there uh, underlying. Uh, apparently, of course, the Go instance, of course, cares if <laughs> there is something. Uh, yes, uh, ridiculously invalid. Um, yes, so the call to my local host with 8081 was not a clever idea. So I probably need to use would need to use another remote um, kind of webhook to kind of emulate this more meaningfully. Let's see. Let's try that again with some made up endpoints because uh, local hosts are worth uh, uh, of course a um, reserved word because it points to the own machine so that's not a good idea it attempts to involve um, resolve it internally i restarted the whole thing let's uh, use example.org again that's pretty okay i hope they will not mind they probably do let's try facebook see what they say I was interested to see. Cool. So, all right, let's go back to two webhooks that are registered. So let's invoke them. Um, ah, hang on. I'll, uh, let's try it again without synchronization. Ah, damn, too late. I started it with uh, synchronization already. Anyway, uh, uh, sorry, with, with um, goal routines already. Let's try that one. So perhaps we get a bit of different outcome that we can uh, discuss if we final one service. Um, now we invoke the service. Again, after having registered the endpoint, we now trigger some event, right? That's the whole idea here. So yeah, it kind of comes back and what we, ah, cool. It doesn't explode. That's interesting. So we get something back um, from Facebook. 
they're not happy with us. They're giving us a 404, I think, an error, error 400 effect, invalid, a bad response, bad request. Cool. Um, hang on. And the second one. Cool. All right. So you saw the goal routines, um, how they were invoked. That's quite, quite good, actually. Um, so it iterated through uh, uh, the, the example.org record first and then through the Facebook one, right? But you see here, which one gave us the first response? Which was faster than responding? Facebook, right? Cool. So it's not a sequential execution. They were running in parallel, right? But one came out faster than the other one, right? Because otherwise we would have seen the response from example.org, which apparently doesn't seem to be as responsive as Facebook. Surprise, surprise. Um, you know, but otherwise you would have an uh, essentially a sequential execution. So if we do that again without Go, um, then we should see a slightly different result. So just um, try it again. So let's use um, example.org. It definitely blocked the NT new IPs in a few minutes. So let's see, post. Let's try fb.com. And for illustration purposes, let's also try our beloved home institution. Ah, come on. So there you go. Okay, so they are registered now. And then now I'm calling basically on the service tree again, which basically um, forces the service to invoke all those registered records. Just for transparency, they have all been registered here, all those three, right? And let's do some trigger. Oh yeah, okay, that was notably longer. So let's see what we get back here. So those is now, again, I didn't have the go in front of it, right? So I just said basically sequentially execute the routines and that basically means that we should get them in the same order back as we send them. So what's happening? Let's see, hopefully I'm right. So, 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 so. Um, yeah, that looks like the example of org one. It's a very simple, uh, if anyone has seen that before, it's like example of org is like the default kind of URL is super simple in its output. So that's the first one. The second invocation is sending us back a 400. Hey guys, are you kidding me? That was a bad request, not happening again. Here's the body, uh, nothing to report to you guys. So that's fine. And then we did NGNU and NGNU was, wow, cool. I basically just three four four and nobody also good so so you know you see uh, we actually did it in order you can do that but again from a point of scalability you know do it in parallel but it means you don't know when the responses quite come back it doesn't really matter too much anyway i talked more about go routines than i probably should have but nevertheless i just want to motivate why this exists so basically this uh, simple change um spawns those in parallel though so and that's generally the way to go in, in, in to read and go you um, isolate functionality with ideal without side effects. There are some, but nevertheless, ideally without side effects in a, a dedicated function, and then uh, call those via Go routines. That's one way of you parallelize it. Now, this function just run that five million times. I don't care, and then I continue on. Right. So that's the that's the basic idea of what's happening here. And then if things are, go, are going south, uh, so that's it. That's it, literally what it does. Uh, all the service invocation does. Okay, we're running out of time, so I'm not doing the client right now because the client has certain complexity now. The client is no longer an invoker. It also needs to be able to process data, right? Discuss this briefly. But I hope it makes sense to this point. What do I want you to take away from this for now? Well, webhooks follow the publish subscribe scheme, right? So I'll share the slides. You can have a look again to follow through the kind of ideas there that underlie this. So and to ensure that you understand how it's actually composed and how it kind of works, right? So the idea of a callback is something that came up uh, subscribing to, for example, a um, uh, exchange service or whatever else. I don't know, uh, whatever example comes to mind. Perhaps you have better examples you can think about, uh, think of. Let's bring, bring us back up. Um, and how it's different, of course, from the uh, classical polling request, but also the, the, the baggage that you bring along, right? Here, there's a lot more things you need to do. As of now, we basically have talked about this side here. We, I showed you how to briefly, how we can model a registration. Very simple, very blunt, very straightforward with a given payload, right? What's the endpoint in some whatever event you're interested in? And then I modeled the invocation just by calling using Postman this endpoint here. And the server tried to invoke all those endpoints, all the webhooks that had been registered before. 
but we haven't talked about the client yet. So that's something we're doing on Wednesday, uh, following up on this discussion. So, but ensure that you get a rough understanding because I'll ask you on Wednesday, and I still need to think about a sanction that's going to incur if you don't know or don't recall what we talked about. But I think that's important because it's very relevant to your assignment. In your assignment, you are building this yourself effectively, right? So you kind of need to emulate the structure somehow. Uh, if you look at the assignment, even after today's discussion already, perhaps you see the patterns already, right? Because already, this is the payload of the registration. This is how you see registered endpoints. And that's how the invoking payload should look like, right? Hopefully in the light of this, that all makes a bit more sense, right? So how we look like. And uh, if of help, I can recommend you take a piece of paper. Yes, it exists, even for computer scientists. And draw this whole thing out, how your service probably should look like, right? Where the third parties are, like those COVID services and the policy service, where your service is and where the client is, right? So, you know, and all what you need to build. Because this time you kind of need to build at least two services. Yeah? Cool. Homework for Wednesday. If you have any other questions regarding the assignment by then anyway, now hopefully getting this insight, then we can also discuss those um, on Wednesday. Good. Other than that, uh, you listened long enough, I believe. Some ears are steaming already. Um, it looks like I'm already like, trying to set up uh, their GitLab uh, to, to like a Discord uh, webhook or something to like see their own changes pop up in Discord. Ah, OK. There's another uh, idea from, from Jon Ginner. Uh, what you can do, less for your own perusal, but also convenience, perhaps you can link up uh, networks, actually. Um, GitHub, right? GitHub um, integration um, action events such as committing a, uh, a, a, a yeah, committing a commit, is that a thing? Anyway, committing code in the first place or pushing commit rather, uh, or uh, uh, issue tracking uh, in your own GitLab project that you know you have control to, uh, and perhaps link it to Discord so you can send notifications to Discord, uh, dedicated channels or as DMs, for example, direct messages which is possible as well. So that's the matter of configuration. It's not really programmatic at all, but it shows you how those uh, webhooks actually work in, in, in practice, in production systems. That's right. So if you, if you want, go for it. It can actually be quite cool uh, for yourself to see it um, happening. Actually, you can also, we could do that as well, actually post to the cloud uh, channel when we have a new incoming issue, right? We could do that. That is actually not a bad idea. That ensures that people that may not have subscribed to all um, uh, uh, labels to get a notification. So I don't want to do it overburdening, but we don't get that many issues, so it's probably not too tricky. Okay. Yeah, like what? Cool. Yeah, yeah, that's right. A few issues. Good. Cool. Okay. See you on uh, Unstuck and, uh, you know, start conceptualizing your um, assignment and get an understanding of webhooks.